problem today is not how sinful the society is. That is a problem. Our problem today is that the saints who could do something about it don't and won't. Our problem today is not that schools are bad. Our problem is that the saints are not making a difference in the bad schools. You are the salt of the earth. My name is Jeremy Del Rio and I'm with the Coalition of Urban Youth Workers here in New York City. I'm outside of a public school in the Lower East Side of Manhattan, which for us represent the frontier of urban youth ministry. We've promised kids for decades that if they stay in school, they'll be all right. They'll come out the other end with the skills they need to achieve in life. But the reality is that for decades, that's been largely an empty promise for the majority of kids. When 60% of 1.2 million kids can't read at grade level, 70% can't do math at grade level. That means that no matter how many times you tell them to stay in school, uh, for all but, but a few, they come out the other end ill-equipped to compete in an information economy, ill-equipped to manage household finances. And we believe that, you know, whatever these young people become, whatever this generation becomes, 20, 30 years from now, that'll be our, our nation and our nation's leaders. I've spent a lot of time outside of school when school gets let out. I see the students, thousands of students, all walking down the sidewalk, all getting on the subways, and I ask myself, how in the world can I reach all these? There has to be a way. And then it dawns on me, I'm where they are. The community of faith is already positioned within schools all across the city to make a meaningful impact. Jesus was a street preacher. Uh, he did not stay inside the synagogues. Jesus did not just immediately open and said, look, I am the Son of God. He communicated and, and met the felt needs of individuals so that they could have a listening ear and an open heart. 2020 vision for schools is an idea that if we begin as communities of faith to engage schools in meaningful relationships, we can see individual schools and more importantly the students within those schools transformed. We're looking to see every school adopted by a local church. And one of the first things that we want to do in the 2020 vision is to pray for schools. We believe churches can at least do that. What we're asking churches to do is commit that as often as they pray as a congregation, that they would pray specifically and strategically for that local school. Not every school in the city, but one school within walking distance of their church. Then we move beyond prayer to recognize that God has already equipped and positioned us to be answers to those prayers. And so the first step towards answering is to develop a relationship of trust with that school. Then as that trust level unfolds, we invite churches to respond to felt needs at the school. Do something tangible and discreet. It may be a beautification project or it might be the sponsorship of a holiday production or it, it could be anything. But the point is that it would be a real legitimate felt need of that particular school. Then as we do acts of service, it's the challenge is take it to the next level and become an ongoing presence at the school. Mentoring, tutoring, and dozens of other opportunities. And then finally, it's our belief that as we've engaged at that level, we'll, we'll have credibility to speak to policy issues. 2020 begins as a prayer strategy. It begins as congregations humble themselves and seek God's face and His passion and His conviction for schools. As that happens, we will change, and as we change, we'll become agents of change. We want to see the crime rate to go down. We want to see dropout rates to decline. We want to see statistically what happens when churches adopt schools. So it's very important that what is being envisioned by 2020 takes root in the, from the pulpit to the pews. They become an army of people to invest in the life of tomorrow. Good evening, CCDA. My name is Jeremy Del Rio, and I'm with 2020 Vision for Schools. It's a real treat to be here, not just because it's CCDA and you all are family to me, but because this year the themes have been innovation and education. I've been asked to come and, and put some flesh around all the great stories that, that we've heard, but also 
to make it a little bit uh, tangible, to give a call to action, right? We come to a place like this and we're inspired by the stories. We get the information, the data sometimes is so much that we're on overload because then we get home on Monday and the schools in our neighborhood are still a mess. The kids in, that we care so deeply about in our community development agencies are students at the bad schools and they're struggling in this place and, and we go back desiring to figure out where do I start? How do I begin? Is there something tangible that I can do to begin working towards sustainable change? And as we do that, I wanna summarize real quick two of the themes that I've heard since I've been here. The first is the stark reality. The fact that in cities and poor school districts around our country, fewer than half the kids in those schools actually graduate. But perhaps even more stark is that the average graduate from those school districts read at an eighth grade level, which for us should, should alarm us, should grieve us, because those are the ones who actually did what we told them. We said, just finish. If you just stick it out, you'll be okay. You'll be positioned to get out of poverty. But the fact is that's an empty promise for too many kids. And we were reminded this morning by Jonathan Brooks that yes, those underperforming schools, they're failing many of our students, but we're failing those schools. I wanna give you the backstory behind 2020. It begin, began, if you could take a little time, uh, travel with me and if we could get the slide back up. In February of 2005, I, I was co uh, privileged to co-chair the Youth Committee for Billy Graham's Final Crusade. In February of 05, we gathered in a, in a conference ballroom just like this, except the hotel was Midtown Manhattan, not the Midwestern United States. But 787 youth workers came out to find out how they could plug into the crusade. Two things are important about that for this story. The first is, I'm ashamed to admit that it was only in preparing for the crusade that youth workers began to think strategically about adopting schools. But I'm ashamed to admit that because our purposes for adopting the schools was to poach the fish. We were there only to make an 87-year-old farm boy from North Carolina relevant to black and brown kids in the projects. Somehow try to get them to come and listen to him preach. Right? We weren't there to meet the schools on their terms. The other thing happened that day that was a game changer for us. One of the, the presenters asked how many of those youth workers actually got paid to do youth ministry. A couple dozen hands went up. The next question was how many of you are volunteers? It was everybody else in the room. If you can imagine 800 people in a room and a couple dozen respond to one invitation, everybody else responds to the other. For us that day was a stark visual of when Jesus said the harvest is plentiful but the laborers are few. Our churches, you have to understand the context. We have two million young people, 18 and under, in the five boroughs of Manhattan. The fifth largest of New York, I'm sorry. The fifth largest city in America are the 18 and unders who populate New York. 1.1 million of them populate our public schools. The 10th largest city in America are the students in our public schools. And we weren't thinking about how to engage them. And somehow our churches expected a couple dozen paid vocational youth workers to, to reach all of those young people. So we were motivated after that day because the verse doesn't end with, with too few laborers. It said, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers. Now we were thinking about schools already, but as I've confessed, our thoughts about the schools weren't necessarily pure. We thought about them to serve our agenda of getting young people to come out and hear Billy Graham. But because we were thinking about schools and we were wrestling through the issues, we realized that the fish we cared about congregated in schools every day 
We didn't, we weren't there because we were volunteers and, and we had day jobs doing other things. But who was the Lord of the harvest positioning to impact all of those young people? And we realized as we heard this morning that we had been failing to serve those schools. You heard in the video the numbers in New York. There are, uh, now there are 1,700 public schools in New York. There are 7,100 self-described evangelical, charismatic, and Pentecostal churches in New York. That's more than five churches for every one school. Nationally, I don't have numbers that includes every denomination, but 300,000 evangelical churches in, in the country and 100,000 public schools in the country. What would happen if three churches actually prayed for every one school? Dare we expect God to answer those prayers? But what if we push it a little further and recognize that if the school is in my neighborhood, maybe he has positioned me, he's relocated me into the neighborhood to become an answer to those very prayers. And if we did that, we, our conviction became that the promise of public education, which was empty for too many, might actually become realized because God has already positioned us for impact. The conversation that began after the crusade evolved into 2020 Vision for Schools. We launched as an awareness campaign in the fall of 08. Kids who began first grade that year are the high school graduating class of the year 2020. Our conviction is we can see that transformation in a generation if people like you and me, people of faith, actually exercise that faith and do what God has already positioned us to do. He's placed us there, and if we do that, we'll transform education. Something else happened in 05. My brother, who's in one of these pictures, was the youth pastor at the church, and he had a brainstorm that changed my life. I told you my motivation for thinking about schools was to poach fish, right? His motivation for thinking about schools was to expand his youth ministry because the public school across the street from our youth center fed most of the kids into his youth group. And he thought if he'd work in the school, his access to the kids would multiply and his access to the, the parents would multiply. You've met Pastor Lou, the associate pastor at Abounding Grace. Well, that's his church. And so those are his church clothes in the picture, right? And that's a picture of the seventh and eighth graders at the middle school that they began to adopt in 2006 with a very different agenda. They started to meet the school on its terms. In the summer of 2007, after Jonathan became a teacher and the missions director transferred from the school she was teaching at in Brooklyn to also teach at PS34, they did a beautification project which involved 10 murals in the schoolyard about empowering young people to achieve their dreams. This guy is my dad. He began to feed his sheep differently. He's the pastor of the church. And so they began to host barbecues for the graduating classes of the middle school and bring breakfast to the teachers in the teacher's lounge in the morning as an act of appreciating their investment. I'm proud to report that in the five years since Abounding Grace has adopted PS34, Every one of the standardized tests that has been given, it's a K through 8 school, every single one with the exception of one year's 8th grade science test, which stayed flat, every other exam has improved every year for five years. Why? We can't claim credit for that, but we know a God who answers prayer. And they began to pray, and they began to go in and hold assemblies with the students. It reminds me of the verse that where we find Moses being called to deliver his people from 400 years of slavery, not 40 years of broken schools, but 400 years of institutional oppression in the form of slavery, actual bondage, right? And he's waiting there and God shows up miraculously in a burning bush and he says, Moses, Moses, and Moses responds and says, here I am. I am CCDA, right? Here I am 
It's locational. I'm right here. You're calling me. I'm here. But Moses said to God, who am I? Right now Moses flips it because God just told him what he wants him to do. I want you to go back and deliver the people. So now he says not, I am here, but who am I? He questions his identity, right? And he says, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and, and drive out uh, the bring us out from slavery. God said, I will be with you. Why? Because I am who I am. This is what you're to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. I am. When I say I am CCDA, I identify not only with CCDA, but with the original I am. The original I am who empowers me to be like he is. Who gives me the same grace he has to say, I am here, Lord. Send me. But the beautiful thing about it is it's a prayer that can get translated for any school, any place. You can't go into the school and say, God sent me. But you can say, I'm here. I am my school. It's a prayer we can own and identify with that says this school will only go as far as I take it because I am has sent me to you. I am has placed me in proximity to you. I am has placed my children in your school. I am has placed the teachers from my congregation in your school. I am has dispersed us. And as we wrestled through the implications of that, we realized that in the same church that might have an active youth ministry of a dozen adult volunteers teaching Sunday school and leading the youth group on the same church on the same Sunday, They've got 50 to 80% of the people in the pews who can say like Moses, I am has sent me to you. I'm a student in this school. I'm a teacher in the school. I'm a parent of a student, a grandparent of a student, otherwise related to a student or a teacher. I'm a principal, a custodian, a secretary. I'm walking your halls. I've been positioned by God to make a difference in that place. And so I am became a prayer strategy and we utilized the free technology of Google Maps. We plotted out every public school in New York and told churches, find your church address in relationship to all the schools and prayer walk the schools. And in 2010, about a dozen prayer walks happened all over the city and these are some of the photos. One of the churches is in the neighborhood that my wife and I have lived for two, 21 years. Well, I've lived there for 21 years. We've been married 14. Every one of those years has been there. Our kids have been born there. And our son attended the local elementary school. 1,200 students attended that local elementary school. We happen to be living in one of the fastest growing Arab Muslim communities in all of New York City. After 9-11, Arab Muslims were subject to pretty tremendous uh, bigotry by our brothers and sisters. We didn't know what to do, and I became a Pharisee. My prayer was, God, I thank you that I'm not like those other Christians who are full of bigotry towards our neighbors. But I was a Pharisee because I did nothing about it until my son attended the school. And the school was one of those with the scaffolding in the previous window when we did the prayer walk. And the summer after the prayer walk, the scaffolding came down and it became a blank canvas. And so a local church in the neighborhood had an art center. So we asked the school, would you mind if we paint a mural that welcomes all of our immigrant kids into our school? Let's welcome them and make them feel like this is a safe space where they're free to become who they're made to be. Because I am, right? I am made them that way. And so over the course of six weeks this past spring, 400 volunteers executed an 875 square foot 
welcome-themed mural, which all of the content was inspired by 100 students who responded to the question, how do you welcome guests into your home? Why? Because Mexicans do it differently than Moroccans who do it differently than Malaysians, and we have all of them in the school. And so we wanted to find out how they do it and also empower students to do it like their families do it. And so some of the vignettes from there show what that looks like. It's take inviting the stranger to become part of the community. And when it was finished, we went to five youth groups in the church and said, we want you to throw a party for the school. You love to throw parties, right? And so 75 volunteers from five youth ministries came and threw a party for 1,500 people from the community over four hours, inflatables, food, all kinds of fun stuff, music, DJ, the whole nine. Politicians came, got their photo ops. It was an amazing day, right? <laughs> and Christians were throwing party for Arab Muslim kids and their families. Why? Because I am has sent me to you. This week, the New York City Department of Ed featured on its homepage the story of the mural at PS 102. Why? Because I am has sent me to you. Ladies and gentlemen, as we return, we return with an invitation to reflect the I am that we identify with. Every time we're tempted to say, I'm so frustrated at these schools. I'm mad as hell and I'm not taking it anymore. I'm depressed by what we see. I'm Think about the I am you're reflecting because I am, the I am, is none of those things. He's not so discouraged that he can't find an opportunity to make a life better. That's our invitation, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a parent, whether you're a student, whether you're a pastor, pastors, executive directors, leverage your influence. Leverage your influence and inspire your people to become the salt and to be the light that God has positioned them to be. The light is not our capacity to preach great sermons or have great conferences. The light Jesus talks about in Matthew 5 are the good deeds that we complete that glorify our Father in heaven, that reflect the ultimate I am, the one who has sent us and called us to transform every underperforming public school in the United States of America. Thank you so much. It's been a real honor to be with you all tonight.